The special guest speaker at Historicon this year was Nicholas Lloyd, widely known on YouTube as Lindy Beige. He makes some fantastic, often funny videos about historical weapons, tactics, and a wide range of eclectic topics. He's also known to have a particular interest in Hannibal, developing a graphic novel called In Search of Hannibal. This video is a very short excerpt from a talk he gave at the HMGS War College about Hannibal's role in the Second Punic War. If you want to hear the entire one-hour talk, that will be available through the Historical Miniatures Gaming Society on their website. The clip we're bringing you here focuses on Hannibal's strategy in Italy, and what he may have been aiming to achieve by famously crossing the Alps. Thank you very much. Uh, right, you could say that the, second, the entire Second Punic War was actually an adventure by the Barkid family. Uh, Carthage had a Senate, just like Rome had a Senate, um, but that doesn't mean that Carthage was ordering the Barkids to do everything uh, that the Barkids were doing. In fact, much of the Carthaginian Senate for much of the war was against what the Barkids were doing. The Barkids were extremely wealthy. They were wealthy on a scale that's almost beyond uh, modern imagining. Uh, Bill Gates is, is, is pretty well off. I think we can all agree on that. But the idea of Bill Gates privately funding a war with Russia um, is, you, you, yeah, you, 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 you giggle at that as an idea, but that is sort of what the Barkids did. They, they were incredibly rich, they had silver mines in, um, in Spain, and uh, they, they mined those for all they were worth, and uh, they were pretty good at conquering people, um, and you can always pay mercenaries, not just with, with coins in, up in advance, but with the promise of loot. And so as long as you, you keep being successful, that's one way of paying for an army. But anyway, they have this power base in Spain, and it's from there that they, they launch the war. And it's, it's the Barkids who broke the treaty by uh, besieging, well, a bit of a moot point, but the Romans would say they broke the treaty by uh, besieging Saguntum. Uh, and they kept going, and, they went over, and, and Hannibal took an army over the Pyrenees, and according to uh, Livy and other historians, started marching across Gaul, and it's at this point that his men, a lot of them, twigged, uh, hang on, we're not actually just sorting out the local tribes in northern Spain, which is what I thought we were we were doing. You seem to be, why are we marching across Gaul? You're not, not, you're not going to invade Italy, are you? Seriously, that's a hell of a long way away. And there's the Alps, and the Romans are pretty good. And 3,000 of them deserted. And um, Hannibal caused, uh, brought his army to a halt and sent, sent home another 7,000 men that he thought were a little bit dodgy. He'd rather not have them. He's losing men, and, it, and this tells us as well about how little the men knew uh, under him what his plans were. Um, one of the advantage of having a, an army commanded by one guy is that uh, if anyone gets captured and tortured by the enemy, they won't be able to, to, to say a thing uh, because you've got just one guy who knows what's going on at the top. And it seems that he hadn't told even his own army that he was going to invade Italy. But what was his plan? I see lots of blank faces, mm -hmm. um, and it could be that you're thinking, okay, great, at last, I'm going to learn from this guy what Hannibal's plan actually was. Unfortunately, it's not in any of the history. We have to, we have to infer it. Um, we know that he was trying to separate the allies of Rome. He was trying to separate the, the Samnites and the, the Capuans and, and various other people who'd been subjugated by Rome from Rome. And he had some success at that, but then some of them then started uh, going back in, under the Roman fold. And that would have lowered the power of Rome. So I think that one possibility is that he was trying to uh, free all of the subjugated states around Rome from Roman rule, set them up uh, in, a, in, a, in a stable uh, situation so that they could then in the future defend themselves from further uh, Roman expansion and thus limit Rome's power uh, then perhaps get the Romans to sign a treaty, just as the Carthaginians had in the previous war, and then perhaps that's it, he would have been happy, he could have sailed home. Or, possibly, he was going to set up a Carthaginian colony in Italy, partly in order to keep an eye on Rome and to make sure that Rome had a constant thorn in its side. Uh, he did spend an awful lot of his life, as did almost all the men following him, in Italy. And as some people have pointed out to me, Italy's rather nice, you know, if you're, if you're from a... Um, deserts of North Africa, you might think, oh, actually, it, it is quite nice, quite like the wine, nice olive oil, I'll, I'll stay here. And a lot of the men, perhaps, would have met a woman. Um, and this is one, one issue, a huge issue, which is not in any of the histories, and I've never even read a modern history book which deals with it. 
He arrives with 37,000 men. He allies a load of Gauls and takes them down to the other end of the country and keeps them there for ages. Uh, uh, they're almost all men. If you m march into an area uh, that you're hoping to ally, you've got to say to your, let's say, 50,000 men, oh, uh, and no, no um, disrespecting the local ladies, okay? Because that's really not the great way to make allies. 50,000, an army of 50,000 mercenaries who haven't seen their wives for years and years and years arrive after a big battle. How do you discipline tens of thousands of men to not do that sort of thing, to not steal? These are men who, have, who are on campaign hoping for loot. It was a problem that he had to come up with an answer for. Um, and it could be that he would say, right, everyone's fair game, but just stay away from the noble women, because they're, they're the ones that matter, and it's the nobles we're going to be negotiating with. And what happens to the lower orders uh, just, you know, uh, don't tell them I won't ask. Maybe. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a horrible thought with a modern mindset, uh, but that's not impossible either. But uh, he freed all the Carthaginian slaves in his army. But then, and before you think, oh, so he's here to free the slaves, he's, he's that sort of modern guy, he then said to all the Carthaginian slave owners, oh, but don't worry, I will compensate you. But then we never find out how he's going to do that because again if you if you go into an area you're hoping to ally and you enslave a load of them or steal their slaves in order to compensate the, the uh, people who whose uh, slaves you've just taken again that's not going to put you in a great negotiating position uh, and that's one um, other thing that i notice in in the uh, in the history of the war that there are towns like capua which was the second biggest town in, uh, in Italy after Rome that changed sides and, and for a while at least sided with the Carthaginians, but no ports. Uh, it took him absolutely ages to get a port and he had to go to a huge amount of trouble. The, the, the port of Tarentum, which is right down in the south, it's uh, just in, uh, if you imagine the, there's the stiletto heel of Italy, it's just sort of there. Um, he besieged that for absolutely ages and had a terrible time taking it and in fact um, uh, for a long time he just had a bit of it because the Romans were holding out in, a, in a, another fort immediately across a moat uh, and at one point there were, there were two harbours one either side he had managed to capture one of the harbours but not the other one uh, the, the Romans clung on uh, with, their, with their very nails to that and it seems to me almost suspicious that none of the ports swapped sides even though some of them having swapped sides could have then immediately got all sorts of wonderful trade with Carthage um, so Maybe behind the scenes, the Romans are pouring resources, bribe money to, to the, the people running these, these coastal towns. Don't you change sides, because as long as we can isolate him inside, uh, inside um, Italy, uh, he's stuck. Apologies for the, ramb for the rambling. <laughs> um, uh, to conclude then, why did he lose? It's not because he didn't try to take Rome. Uh, I don't think it was ever his plan to take Rome. Rome would have been an incredibly tough nut to, to crack. There were just so many people in it. Uh, it had very uh, huge fortifications. He had no siege equipment. He had no, um, he had very little success with sieges. And besides, even after Cannae, uh, there were still two Roman field armies out there. And if he just plonked himself in front of Rome, he would have thrown away his main advantage, which, is, which was his mobility. Uh, and they would have trapped him, and then he would have been the besieged, and it would have been all over, and I think he knew that. Uh, he had to, and immediately after Cannae, uh, it's quite clear, that he was very busy negotiating like crazy with all, all the potential allies. That was the time when you had to strike with the iron hot. Okay, everyone, you're on my side now, right? Because I can actually free you from Rome. And this isn't a war of conquest. He, he says in a number of speeches, of course, he could have been lying, but he, he says in a number of recorded speeches that it's not a war of conquest. Um, he's here to make war against Rome, uh, and he's not, against, he's not against any of the allies of Rome, and would be happy to be allies of them himself. So his game plan didn't quite work and what beat him perhaps was just the sheer might of the Roman machine. The Romans had such a strong culture that it never seems to have occurred to them to surrender. Now of course it could be that the, the loads of people were, were um, in, in quite high oppositions were proposing precisely that but it didn't get into the history. Okay right I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, I have actually used up the whole hour but I believe we don't have to hurtle out here so I'm available for, for questions now. What you heard in this video was just a short clip, and if you want to hear the complete one-hour talk, including the audience Q&A session, you can become a member of HMGS and watch all of their War College presentations online.
You can also join us right here on Little Wars TV for an exclusive interview with Nicholas Lloyd where we talk about how he started wargaming, his favorite generals, which Hollywood movie he finds most faithful to history, and much more. And if you somehow aren't aware of his YouTube channel, we think you'll have quite a bit of fun by clicking here and checking out Lindy Beige.